Do you remember your first encounter with mathematical abstraction? When you were shown something more abstract than anything you used to think about before? For me, that happened in the math lesson, when we were told about negative numbers. I still remember feeling utterly confused and quite distressed. Ironically, that precise moment was the first glimpse of K-theory, which later turned out to be the area of my math research. Hey, welcome to Math Life Balance. This is the second video in the series K-Theory Wonderland, made with the help of my friend Peter Hain. In these videos, I want to share with you the beauty of abstraction by talking about complicated concepts in modern math that make me excited, and the main hero is algebraic K-Theory. In the previous video, I explained why I find K-Theory a tasty object for outreach. Watch it if you haven't seen. And today we will get the first glimpse of K-Theory. In the video description, you can find some studying materials and more precise formulations of the statements from the videos. But we have an important disclaimer. If you don't understand what we are saying, don't blame yourself. Instead, blame our presentation if you wish, or Google the words you don't know. It will take you down the K-theory rabbit hole. So what has actually happened that day in the classroom when negative numbers were introduced? Well, at first they were just natural numbers. It was a set with an operation addition, and a neutral element, zero. But there were no inverse elements. Given any number, you couldn't find another number such that their sum would be zero. And then our teacher decided that it's a good idea to artificially add inverse elements to this set. That's how we got all integers out of natural numbers. This process of artificially adding inverse elements is called group completion. It's a magic spell that you can apply to any monoid. So to any set that has a commutative operation, like addition and a neutral element. Group completion turns your monoid into a group in a natural way. Integers are the smallest group that contains the monoid of natural numbers. We will see in the next videos why group completion is indeed magical. But for now, I invite you to appreciate the beauty of this idea. In the math world, if you are unhappy with what you have, you can change the reality and make your wishes come true by artificially imposing the conditions you have without losing track of the information you had. In our case, we had a monoid, which is some structure, but without inverse elements, there is not enough structure to develop new ideas. There are way more books about groups than about monoids. So we turned it into a group just by applying a magic spell and we got the structure we wanted. Now, the reason I was so distressed by negative numbers in primary school is that the operation of group completion is rather artificial. But as I noticed later, Something that looks artificial at first, afterwards quickly becomes second nature. At home, we had a thermometer, like this one, and so it quickly became easy to appreciate negative numbers, especially on snow winter days. Now, K-theory is the same magic spell applied to vector bundles instead of natural numbers. Peter will show us what it means. One of the main players in this story is what we call a vector bundle. And the idea is that it's a family of vector spaces, so one over each point of our geometric object, that should have two properties. So the vector spaces should vary continuously as we move around in this geometric object, but they should also locally look very simple. Around some small neighborhood of a given point, it should just look like you're projecting vertically straight down. There are two important examples of vector bundles to keep in mind. The first, that's the trivial bundle. You can always, over any space, have the constant family of vector spaces. A maybe more interesting example is if you look at the Mobius strip that's sitting over the circle. So if you go around the circle once, the blue line flips over itself. So given a geometric object X, there is an interesting monoid we can associate to X, which we call pi zero vect X. And as a set, it is the set of vector bundles on X up to isomorphism. But much like how we can add vector spaces by taking the direct sum, it also makes sense to take the direct sum fiber-wise of vector bundles, and this operation makes 
this set pi zero vect x into a monoid. So now, since we have a monoid, we have this technology of group completion, and we can define k0 of x as taking this monoid of vector bundles on x up to isomorphism and group completing it. And so now this is an interesting group associated to x. So we can give a few examples of k-theory that come from topology. I mean, the most simple topological space is a point, and a family of vector spaces over a point is just a single vector space. So pi zero vector point, there's one for each possible dimension of a vector space, so it's the natural numbers. And we know that the group completion of the natural numbers is the integers. We might wonder about a more interesting space, like a Euclidean space r to the n. And if you think about this, there's not really an interesting way to make a twisted family of vector spaces over the real line. And it turns out that that's true in any dimension, and there's one for each dimension, so again, we just get the integers. Now for a more interesting example, we can think about the circle. We saw earlier, we, in addition to trivial bundles, have this Mobius bundle. And it turns out that the k0 of the circle consists of a copy of the integers, which basically comes from trivial bundles, plus a copy of z mod 2, and why that's appearing is because if you add the Mobius bundle to itself, you get a trivial bundle. K-theory can appear in different mathematical landscapes. For us, it will be the most interesting to encounter K-theory in the landscape of algebraic geometry, which itself is a thrilling part of mathematics with lots of mysteries. The main species in the landscape of algebraic geometry are algebraic varieties. An algebraic variety is a geometric shape cut out by polynomial equations. That is, it's the zero set of a system of polynomial equations. For example, a parabola, or a sphere, or an elliptic curve, or just an n-dimensional space, are all algebraic varieties. The main hero of our series is K-theory of algebraic varieties, whose official title is Algebraic K-theory. It is built out of vector bundles on an algebraic variety. Such a vector bundle locally looks like an affine space An hanging over the variety, but the gluing functions between different pieces have to be given by polynomials instead of all continuous functions, which makes it a more rigid structure. The fundamental beauty of algebraic geometry is that it is built from a dualism between the algebra of polynomial functions and the geometry of the shapes they define. As a result, for all of the main concepts, you have an intuition coming from geometry and an intuition coming from algebra. For example, the way I described for you a vector bundle is a geometric picture, but one can also look at it from an algebraic perspective. So from the algebraic perspective, we might think about x, that is the set of zeros, to a system of polynomial equations. For example, we could look at the zeros of the polynomial y minus x squared over a field like the real numbers or over the integers. Over the real numbers, this has a familiar plot as a parabola. There's an alternative point of view that we can take as well. There's a ring where this equation is universally solved. Namely, we look at a polynomial ring in two variables, x and y, and we impose the condition that y minus x squared is equal to zero. And the miracle here is that vector bundles on x, which are defined geometrically, these are equivalent to projective modules over this ring r. The consequence of this is that the k-theory of x 
which we defined by taking isomorphism classes of vector bundles and then group completing it. Well, that's the same as taking isomorphism classes of projective R modules and group completing this guy. Now that gives us a new perspective. So if we have any ring, let's call it A, then we can define the K-theory of A by taking isomorphism classes of projective A modules. This is a monoid under direct sum, and we can group complete that. So with this new perspective, we can now give some examples of K0. First, let's consider the case of a field F. In this situation, projective modules are just vector spaces. And vector spaces are determined up to isomorphism by their dimension. So the K theory of a field is just the integers. Now, what if we consider something a bit more complicated like the ring of integers? Well, it turns out Every projective module is just a direct sum of a bunch of copies of the integers. So projective modules over the integers are classified by their rank, and there's one for every natural number. So once again, the k-theory of z is z. Now what about some more complicated examples? What if we consider a polynomial ring in n variables? which geometrically we think of as an n-dimensional space. Well, it turns out that somewhat miraculously, this is also the same as the k-theory of the integers. Now, you might wonder at this point, is k0 always z? And no, that's not the case. It's a more interesting invariant. And one situation in which it's more interesting is in the setting of a Dedekind domain. So these are rings that naturally arise in number theory. And in this case, K0 of a Dedekind domain has a copy of Z, but there's also another copy of a different group called the Picard group of A. And this Picard group generally is non-trivial. As you can see, this construction Applying the magic spell of group completion to projective modules over a ring is in fact valid for any ring, which shows its flexibility. Can I use the ring when I do it? <laughs> Cringe. So, today we talked about group completion, how it leads to the concept of K-theory, and how K-theory looks like in the landscape of algebraic geometry, where it is made out of vector bundles on algebraic varieties and is called algebraic K-theory. More precisely, today we saw only the zeroth level of the K-theory house, its fundament. Next time, we'll talk about higher floors of K-theory and explore further the magic of group completion. See you next Friday! Psst. And please advertise these videos to those who could be interested. <laughs>